My lab, broadly speaking, is interested in understanding how animals make sense of their surroundings and use this information to guide their behavior. And we think about this problem at several different scales. We're thinking about how animals sense signals from the environment, how they use these signals to update inferences about the current states of the environment and make predictions about future states of the environment, and ultimately how they use these internal computations to guide behavior. And so today, I want to tell you about work that we've been doing together with Victor Monarski to understand how these internal computations of inference and prediction can be used to design efficient and adaptable sensory coding schemes. So to give you a, a bit of an introduction and, and historical background to this problem, it's been 40 years now since Simon Laughlin first showed how neurons in the early visual system of the blowfly make efficient use of their limited dynamic range by discriminating those sensory signals here, light intensity signals that are most likely to occur in the environment. And specifically, he showed how we could view the tuning curves of these neurons as performing a type of histogram equalization, whereby they partition this distribution of incoming sens uh, sensory signals into equal probability chunks, and then assign these chunks to discrete response states of the neuron. And in this way, the output of this neuron maximizes the amount of information that it conveys about this incoming distribution of sensory signals. And so this was an early test of the efficient coding hypothesis, which posits that sensory systems are efficiently tuned to the statistics of their inputs. And a consequence of efficient coding is that if this distribution were to change in time, we would expect that the tuning properties of these neurons would also change in time to keep up with what's going on in the environment. And so in this way, efficient coding has given us a normative perspective on sensory adaptation, which we can think of as the process of dynamically reallocating a set of limited resources to keep up with changes in the outside world. And so to illustrate this idea further, I want you to consider a simple linear nonlinear model of a neuron that encodes patches from a natural image via linear filter and then transforms the output of this linear filter into a stochastic res uh, spiking response via this adapting nonlinearity. And now in any naturalistic setting, the image patches that this model neuron will encounter will vary across different regions of the image. And so we can think of these as different statistical contexts that the model neuron might encounter. And then we can ask, how should this neuron um, dynamically tune this nonlinearity in order to minimize uh, decoding error? So best decode the, uh, the outputs of this linear filter. Now we can approximate these statistical contexts by different distributions of filter outputs. And here we're just considering a set of um, nine different Gaussian distributions um, whose uh, mean and variance changes. Um, this captures the variability that we see uh, in an ensemble of natural images. And now we can design what I'll call uh, a local oracle code that tunes this nonlinearity to each of these contexts individually. And now we can compare the performance of that code to what I'll call a static code um, that uses a single fixed nonlinearity that's matched to the marginal distribution of filter outputs across all nine contexts. And now if we compare the performance of these two codes, we see that the Oracle code outperforms the static code here by about 20%. So here I'm just telling you something that you already know, which is that it can be advantageous to adapt to the local statistical context. And here we see that that adaptation reduces this decoding error. Now there's a problem in the logic that I've set up here, and that's that this type of Oracle code requires that the system already know the underlying statistical context. And in any naturalistic scenario, um, the neuron and the, the sensory system has to estimate that statistical context from the same stream of incoming sensory signals that it's trying to decode. And so we can treat this more naturalistic, more realistic setting by building in an ideal observer model that constructs an estimate of the underlying context from the output of this model neuron, and then uses this estimate of context to adapt this nonlinearity here to minimize the expected decoding error. And so if we build a code like this, then we see that the performance of this code is intermediate between the Oracle code and the static code. And I'm gonna to refer to this as the naively adaptive code. Now, the reason that this naively adaptive code has higher error than this Oracle code is because it's using a context estimate rather than the true context um, to adapt uh, its encoding nonlinearity. And that estimate can be wrong. 
So for example, if the context is changing over time, there will be times when the system's estimate of that context is correct. And we'll refer to these as peri uh, matched periods. And I'm gonna denote these in white. And there will be times when this context estimate is incorrect. And we'll refer to these as mismatched periods. And I'm going to color these in gray. And these mismatched periods correspond to times when the system is using the wrong nonlinearity for the underlying context. And now we can ask how much error is arising in these matched versus mismatched periods. Now, our Oracle code by construction is always matched to the underlying context. So all of the error that it produces is produced during these matched periods. But if we now look at our naively adaptive code, um, we see that a large fraction of its error arises during these mismatched periods where the context estimate is incorrect. And so what we've been interested in understanding is whether we can design better codes than this naively adaptive code. So codes that reduce the errors that are arising during these mismatch periods. Okay, so to push this idea just a little bit further, um, the Oracle and the naively adaptive code, again, differ in their context knowledge. The Oracle code has perfect context knowledge. The naively adaptive code has imperfect context knowledge. But nevertheless, these two codes use this context knowledge to try to minimize this matched error. And so what we'd like to do is ask whether we can design codes that use this context knowledge in a different way to try to reduce the error that arises during these mismatched periods. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to design families of codes that try to balance these two different sources of errors. And we're gonna parameterize this family of codes by what I'll call a bias alpha that goes between zero and one. So at one end of the, the extreme, um, we have a, what uh, our naively adaptive code that corresponds to a value of alpha equals zero. This code minimizes matched error by construction. On the other end of the spectrum, we're gonna be trying to uh, develop what I'll call fully biased codes that correspond to a value of alpha equals one um, that try to minimize this mismatched error. Now mismatched error can be high for two reasons. It can be high because the instantaneous error rate during these periods is high, or because these mismatch periods are very long. And so there are different ways of biasing the code that reduce either this error rate or the duration of mismatches. And these different forms of biasing the code will uh, manifest in different ways of adapting this, uh, this encoding nonlinearity. So to give you a specific example of this, if I bring back in these nine different contexts here, and we assume that the system at some, at some point in time estimates that the environment is in context one. Then a naively adaptive code is one that tries to tune its nonlinearity to minimize errors if that context estimate is correct. Okay, so I think I'm in context one, I'm going to design my nonlinearity to minimize errors assuming that that estimate is correct. And the, the optimal nonlinearity for this is exactly the nonlinearity we just worked out on the previous slide. But now we could try to bias this nonlinearity towards reducing um, the uh, mismatched error rate. And to do that, we want to try to minimize the errors if that context estimate is incorrect. So I think I'm in context one, but I'm going to hedge my bets against the other context and, and try to minimize errors that could arise if I'm wrong about that context. Alternatively, we could try to reduce the duration of mismatches by designing a nonlinearity that best discriminates between contexts and allows a system to quickly detect a change. And so you can see that these three nonlinearities differ from one another. And this, this is uh, particular to this, uh, this context one, but this would be the case if we work this out for all of the other contexts here. And so these differences in the nonlinearities will manifest in differences in performance as this system is adapting in this dynamic environment. And so what we'd like to ask is, can we bias the code in a way that allows us to identify what I'll call an optimally adaptive code that outperforms this naively adaptive code? And again, the way we're gonna to try to do this is try to reduce these periods of mismatched error in a way that reduces total error overall. Okay, so I've sketched this out in this very specific example of a linear nonlinear model, uh, model neuron that's adapting to different distributions of filter outputs. But the problem that we're interested in, uh, interested in tackling here is much more general than this specific scenario. So we're interested in understanding how a resource constrained system dynamically performs a sensory task in a, a changing environment. And as we just saw, 
if this environment is changing in time, it can be beneficial for the system to keep an estimate of, of those changes. And that estimate is maintained in this, uh, this ideal observer model here. And so the question we really wanna get at is how should this resource constrained system dynamically allocate its limited resources in order to balance these two competing objectives? So on the one hand, uh, performing the task that you care about, and on the other hand, keeping up with changes in the environment that allow you to perform that task well. Okay, so these are the two things that we want to try to balance with this system. And so given that more general picture, I wanna take a moment to, to give some intuition about how these different sources of errors uh, interact with uh, one another and contribute to the overall performance of the system. All right, so as I mentioned, we want to design codes that reduce this mismatch, uh, mismatched error. And uh, we're going to do this by biasing towards minimizing either the error rate or the duration of mismatches. So here we can sketch out the mismatched error surface. And these contours here are the contours of constant mismatched error. Um, and now we can place our naively adaptive code on this plane. This is going to be our starting point. Um, and we're going to bias away from the starting point. And so our naively adaptive code partitions the space into regions of lower mismatched error and higher mismatched error compared to this starting point. And now we want to bias the code towards minimizing one or the other of these two terms. And so we try to reduce the error rate of mismatches. We're going to be looking for codes that live in this half of the space. And now as we try to bias to reduce this term, this can have different effects on the duration of mismatches and the overall mismatched error. So this is just to say that even if we can reduce this error rate, this can actually lead to increases in the overall mismatched error, depending on how this interplays with the duration of mismatches. Similarly, if we try to bias the code towards reducing the duration of mismatches, we want to uh, find codes that live in this region of the space. And once again, if we manage to reduce this duration, this can have differing impacts on the, the error rate and the overall mismatched error. So this is just to say that biasing the code can sweep out different trajectories in this space and give rise to um, different uh, performances depending on the interplay between these terms. Now, this mismatched error interacts with the matched error to govern the total performance of the system. And so once again, we can sketch out the surface of, of uh, uh, the total error surface. And here, these contours are contours of constant total error. And we can place our naively adaptive code on this plane. And this, once again, partitions the plane into regions of lower or higher total error. And now if we bias the code towards reducing the mismatched error, like you see over here, that can again have differing effects on the matched error and the total error. So once again, even if we manage to reduce this mismatched error, that doesn't guarantee that we're going to improve performance overall. We could be in a situation where we actually increase overall error because of the way these, these error terms balance out. All right, so this is all to say um, that this is uh, uh, all of these uh, error terms interact with one another. So we're going to try to drive down either the error rate or the duration of mismatches, but this can increase errors in other parts of, of, uh, of this coding scheme. Um, and so we'd, what we'd like to identify is whether there are any codes that live in this part of the space, where as we bias away from what's locally optimal, this naively adaptive code, we can actually uh, improve overall performance. And this is exactly um, the scenario um, that I sketched out earlier, where this would be the optimal code here um, that achieves the lowest overall error. Okay, so we've been studying these um, types of error patterns in different, different systems, and we've been looking to see whether we um, can see this particular signature that would identify these globally optimal codes. Um, and we've been thinking about this in the context of several different scenarios, one of which I sketched out at the beginning of this linear nonlinear Poisson neuron. One is a simplification of this neuron. That's a sigmoidal neuron that adapts to changes in variance and, and mean. And finally, we've been thinking about this in the context of populations of, of receptive fields that are adapting to different statistical contexts and natural scenes. And across all of these different scenarios, um, we see that indeed we can bias the code away from what's locally optimal and improve global performance. And so you see this in all three of these scenarios where you can essentially drive down this mismatched error. We see an increase in matched error, but the total error, which is the sum of these two, is, is minimized for some intermediate value of this bias. And so now what I'd like to do is give you an understanding of why this is the case. Why is it that when we bias away from what's locally optimal, we're improving global performance, um, and what are the, the underlying uh, mechanisms of that? 
And so to dig into this, I'm going to focus on this center scenario here, which is a simplification of what I sketched out at the beginning. Um, and so we're going to dive into the, the details of this process. So the specific scenario that we're going to consider here um, is one in which the context changes over time between a low and a high context. This is going to parametrize either the variance or the mean of a Gaussian stimulus distribution. So here you can see the variance is switching from low to high to low, or the mean is switching from low to high to low. And at any point in time, a single stimulus from one of these distributions will be encoded through this adaptive encoder. So this, uh, this is a saturating nonlinearity that maps an incoming stimulus onto a discrete response level. And now this response level is going to be used to do two things. It's going to be used to decode an estimate of the stimulus and update an estimate of the underlying context. And now we're going to try to design a family of um, adaptive codes that balance um, these different sources of errors in different ways. And so on one end of the extreme, we're going to design this naively adaptive code that prioritizes the task at hand, so decoding stimuli. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, we're going to design a fully biased code that prioritizes inference. And so we can think about this spectrum as essentially um, navigating the balance between uh, decoding uh, and, and inference. And so the way that we actually go about constructing these, um, these codes is by adapting the parameters of this nonlinearity. So more specifically, we again have this context that's changing over time. This context parametrizes the distribution of incoming sensory stimuli. At any point in time, a single sensory stimulus is encoded in a discrete response level through this um, saturating nonlinearity here. And this nonlinearity has two parameters, a slope and an offset. Um, and now the output of this encoder is used to um, decode an estimate of the stimulus, S hat, and update an estimate of the context, C hat. And now we're going to construct codes that specify the parameters of this nonlinearity. And so specifically for this naively adaptive code, we're going to choose the parameters of the nonlinearity, the slope and the offset, that minimize the expected decoding error. So this is minimizing the error and decoding the stimulus averaged over the system's expectation of the incoming stimulus distribution. On the other end of the spectrum, we're going to choose the slope and offset of this nonlinearity to minimize the error in the context estimate. Again, given the distribution of stimuli that the system expects to see based on that context estimate. Okay, so these um, give us the two extremes of our family of codes, and then we're going to construct bias codes by essentially weighting these two objective functions. And so I want to begin by giving you some intuition about how these two different codes at the extremes perform relative to one another, and then we'll sort of flesh out this uh, intermediate set of bias codes. Okay, so I'm going to start by comparing um, this code that's designed for decoding versus inference. And these specify um, the adaptation dynamics of different uh, nonlinearities. Non and so we're going to watch how these nonlinearities uh, of these two systems adapt to changes in the mean of a Gaussian stimulus distribution. So I'm going to show you a simulation where this mean changes over time from high to low. And then we'll look at how the system responds to those changes, adapts to those changes. Okay, so as I, as I play this video forward, you'll see that the system on the right adapts much more quickly than the system on the left, as we would expect, but it adapts in a qualitatively different way. So you can see it, it contracts and expands, contracts and expands, whereas the nonlinearity on the left maintains a fixed slope and just uh, scoots left and right. Now I'm going to play this video for you again, but now we're going to track the instantaneous decoding error as a function of time. And so you'll remember that this is what we're trying to minimize overall, that the system is trying to accurately perform this decoding task. Um, and so we'd like this error to be minimized on average, but we're going to track this instantaneously as the system adapts. And so what you'll see is that just after a switch, there's a huge spike in decoding error from the system on the left, even though this system is optimized for accurate decoding. On the other hand, the system on the right shows a modest increase in decoding error uh, just after a switch. 
And if we now look at what happens as the system stabilizes, and you can see that better in this inset here, you'll see that as the system adapts, eventually this purple system on the left does achieve a lower decoding error. So once a system has accurately updated its, its estimate of context and has adapted to this change, then it does indeed um, uh, achieve this lower decoding error. And so this already starts to illustrate the trade-offs that we see in performance from biasing the code. And so specifically, these two different codes balance these two sources of matched and mismatched error in very different ways. And so if we bring back in this picture, we see that um, the, uh, the matched error um, we're getting insights into this matched error from this, uh, this error pattern in the inset here, where the system that's designed for decoding, again, minimizes this, this matched error. Whereas this main panel here tells us something about what's happening during periods of mismatch, where we see that um, this naively adaptive system achieves this very high error. And so now if we bring back in this picture that we introduced earlier, where we compare the mismatched error to the matched error, we see that these two systems sit at very different points in this, in this error surface because of the ways that they balance these sources of errors. And now if we um, bring in this whole family of biased codes, we, we sort of sweep out a trajectory in this, play, in this plane. So we see that biasing the code towards inference um, reduces this mismatched error at the cost of increasing this matched error. But you can see that the total error, which is the sum of these two, is minimized for um, some intermediate value of bias. So again, this tells us that biasing away from what's locally optimal can improve global performance when the environment is changing in time. And we see this um, in this case where the mean of the stimulus distribution is switching in time, but we also see this when the variance of the stimulus distribution is, is switching in time. So we see the same trade-off between these error terms, and we see that the optimal code um, is minimized for this intermediate value of bias. Okay, so now I'd like to dig in a bit more and, and give you some intuition as to why um, uh, these bias codes are outperforming the naively adaptive code. And so to do this, I want to dig into how these nonlinearities are actually adapting based on the system's estimate of context. And so you'll remember that these adapting nonlinearities map an incoming stimulus onto a discrete response level. And so we can project these response levels back through the nonlinearity and onto the stimulus axis. And this gives us a picture of how the um, system partitions um, the stimulus space. And so the steeper this nonlinearity is, the closer these lines will be together. And if this nonlinearity is shifted, you'll see these lines shifting. And so this is how we read out um, these nonlinearities. And this one dimensional projection now allows us to compare many nonlinearities together. And so I'm going to start um, by considering this system that um, is designed to accurately decode the stimulus in, in an environment where the mean of the stimulus distribution is switching in time. Um, and if we look at what happens when the system is certain that the environment is in the high context, you can see that it aligns its nonlinearity underneath this high distribution of stimuli. And similarly, when the system is certain of the low context, it aligns its nonlinearity underneath this low distribution. And this is exactly what we would expect from the Laughlin example that I, that I gave you at the very beginning. You can think of this as a re-representation of that type of example. But now what we've done with this work is we've fleshed out what should happen in between these extremes when the system is uncertain of that underlying context. Um, and we can parameterize this uncertainty in terms of the, um, the observer's belief that the environment is in the high state. And so what we see for a system that's designed for accurate decoding is that um, it linearly interpolates between these two extremes. And this is exactly what we saw in the video earlier. So you'll remember we saw a nonlinearity with a fixed slope that just shifted left and right. We can see that fixed slope here because the spacing between these lines does not change. And the only thing that changes is, is the location and it just shifts linearly um, to track the system's belief. Now we can, uh, we can repeat this for a system that's designed for accurate inference. And here already you can see that the um, nonlinearities when the system is certain of either the high or the low context are different. So you can see that they're broader and the nonlinearity is devoting some of its resolution to stimuli that would occur in the other context. And now if we look what's happening uh, in between when the system is uncertain, we see something that's qualitatively different. 
Um, so here we see that um, for these intermediate levels of, of uncertainty, um, the nonlinearity sharpens and centers between these two distributions. And this is again what we saw um, in the video. So you'll remember we saw the sharpening of the nonlinearity followed by this expansion. And this sharpening happens when the system is uncertain of that underlying context. And this sharpening and centering allows the nonlinearity to quickly resolve stimuli that would signal either the low or the high distribution. And so you can think of this as a form of uncertainty dependent change detection. Now we can try to generalize this picture to the case where the variance is switching in time. Um, and so I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about what you would expect if we were to generalize these results for accurate decoding to a case where the variance is changing in time. Okay, so if the system believes that the environment is in the high variance state, so up here at the top of the plot, we would expect the nonlinearity to be very broad and centered. If the system believes the environment's in the low variant state, we would expect the nonlinearity to be very narrow and centered. And in between, if it's following the same strategy, we would expect it to linearly interpolate between these, these two extremes. And so we'd expect to get sort of a V shape in, in the lines that we see here. Um, and that's exactly what we find. Now it's a bit harder to intuit what you would expect to see in this case where the system is, is designed for accurate inference. But we again see a form of uncertainty dependent change detection, although here it's asymmetric. So when the system is more certain that the environment is the high, in the high context state, but still somewhat uncertain, which you see here, you see that the nonlinearity actually shifts to the tail of this distribution in order to resolve stimuli that would signal this high variance distribution. And I should note that we see two um, equally good solutions, um, one that shifted towards the left tail and the other that shifted towards the right tail. We picked this solution because it minimizes the firing rate on, on average. Okay, but e both strategies will try to shift the nonlinearity um, towards the edge of this distribution to resolve those stimuli that would signal this, this broad variance. Now, if the system is more certain that the environment is in the low variant state, you can see that um, it tightens this nonlinearity and centers it underneath this, this, high, uh, this low variance distribution. And so again, this allows a system to resolve those stimuli that would signal this low variance distribution. And so we again see these patterns of uncertainty dependent change detection that this neuron uses to um, detect changes in this underlying context. And now if we look at an intermediate code that's intermediate between these two extremes, we, we see that it shares features of the code designed for decoding and the code designed for inference. Now, this picture once again tells us how the system partitions the stimulus space depending on the observer's belief about the underlying statistical context. And so given a specific belief, so for example, the, uh, the system believes that the environment is in the low state, um, then this tells us how the system is going to partition incoming stimuli and map them onto these discrete response levels. And now we can use this to read out the firing rate of our model neuron um, as a function of, of the system's uncertainty. Um, but to do that, we need to um, assign values to these response levels. And so one way to do that is to uh, assign a discrete set of spike counts to the output of this nonlinearity. And here I'm going to uh, color these spike counts um, using darker colors for fewer spikes, brighter colors for more spikes. And so we can think of this as a way of sort of color coding this system and telling us which parts of stimulus space are assigned um, how many spikes. And so I'm going to propagate this coloring through this whole picture now. And now you can see how the system is sort of assigning chunks of, of incoming distributions to this output. Now this, this coloring is based on the system's internal belief about the environment. The frequency with which these spike counts will actually be used depends on um, the relationship between this belief and, and reality. And so we can consider the two different situations where this belief is, is correct versus incorrect. So for example, if the environment, or if the system again believes the environment is in the low context state and that belief is correct, so we're in the matched condition, then this is the distribution of stimuli um, that the system will see. And now we can use this um, partitioning to partition this incoming distribution of stimuli and read, read out the histogram of spike counts that we would expect to see. Now we can consider the case that the environment switches. So the system thinks the environment's in the low context, 
but the environment has just switched to the high context. And so now the system is receiving stimuli from this much broader distribution and its internal model is mismatched to what's happening in the outside world. And so here you can see that we get this very skewed distribution of spike counts where the, the bulk of, of this distribution is being mapped onto these outermost response levels. And so we can see that the distribution of spike counts changes when the environment changes. But you can see that the mean of this distribution does not change. So if we were to track the average firing rate by averaging over this histogram, we would not see a change in that average firing rate when, when the environment switches from, um, from low to high variance. And that's a consequence of how we've mapped the output of this nonlinearity onto these spike counts. And this gives us back something that does not at all resemble anything that's measured uh, experimentally. And so we can modify this by um, essentially recoding the output of this nonlinearity. And we're going to perform that recoding based on the system's internal belief uh, about the environment. Okay, so again, if the system believes the environment is in the low state, it expects that its response levels will be used with this frequency. And so we're going to assign spikes based on this expected distribution. And specifically, we're gonna assign the fewest spikes to the response levels that the system expects to use with most frequency. And this is a form of entropy coding. Um, and so this will assign few spikes to these most likely levels and high spikes to these, um, what would be expected to be the least likely levels. And so this gives us a way of reassigning spikes um, to these response levels based on the system's internal belief. And we can think about this again as a recoding of the output of this nonlinearity. And I'm going to, as before, I'm going to color code this according to um, low spikes being darker colors, high spike counts being brighter colors. And now we can propagate that recoloring back through this entire picture. And this is what we get. So we're looking at the same picture as before. It's just that now we've recolored this space based on this recoding of, of spike counts. And so now we can consider the same example that we talked about earlier, um, where uh, again, we can start by considering the case where the system's belief is matched to the current environmental context. And so here um, we see that we get this same um, histogram as before, um, but now this is assigned to different spike counts. And so if we average this distribution, we see we get a lower firing rate on average. So this entropy coding um, lowers the average firing rate of, of this model neuron. And now if we look just after a switch, so again, the environment has switched to the high variance state, we get this skewed distribution here. But now you see that the bulk of this distribution is being mapped onto high spike counts here. And so we would expect to see an increase in the firing rate just after a, an increase in the stimulus variance. Okay, so this tells us, as we would expect, that the um, firing rate of this neuron um, will vary depending on the system's internal belief and how well that belief aligns with reality. And so now we can dynamically track this belief over time and read out a trajectory, a firing rate trajectory of this model neuron. And so I'm going to show you a simulation of this. Um, at the top here, um, we're going to be switching uh, from a low variance to high variance to low variance. And in this upper panel, we're going to be tracking the system's belief about that underlying context. This belief, as you'll see over here, is going to be used to select the appropriate nonlinearity. Um, and you'll see that nonlinearity changing down below here. Now, this nonlinearity will be used to partition this incoming distribution of stimuli, which will determine this histogram of spike counts and ultimately determine the firing rate. Okay, so I'm gonna play this video for you twice. There are a lot of moving parts, so you'll have a couple of chance to watch it. Um, <clears throat> but here we go. Okay, so you can see just after an increase in variance, there's an abrupt increase in firing rate followed by a decay. And in a moment, you're going to see um, that the environment uh, decreases in variance. And there's going to be a huge concentration of probability mass here corresponding to low spike counts. And so we're going to see this drop in firing rate followed by a recovery. Okay, I'm going to show this uh, one more time. Again, an abrupt increase in firing rate where we get this asymmetric distribution. Followed by a drop in firing rate where the probability mass is concentrated on these few spike counts. 
Okay, so this allows us to take this picture of how the system is partitioning the stimulus space based on its belief and read out the dynamic trajectory of, of firing rates in response to different changes in, in input statistics. And here we've walked through an example for one specific code. So you'll remember back, this is the code that's designed for accurate decoding, but this is just one code in an entire spectrum of, uh, of different codes. And so we can use the same approach to read out firing rates anywhere along this entire spectrum. And so I'm gonna pick two specific codes to compare. I'm going to um, read out the firing rate dynamics of the most accurate code. This is the code that minimized decoding error overall. This is our optimally adaptive code. And I'm going to show you the code that's the fastest to adapt. This is the fully biased code that prioritizes inference. And now if we use the same approach to read out the firing rate dynamics in response to increases and decreases in variance, you see that both of these um, model neurons show an increase in firing rate when the variance increases followed by a decay. You can see that in both cases here, but they show qualitatively different responses to a decrease in variance. So this neuron shows a drop in firing rate followed by a recovery. This shows an increase in firing rate followed by a decay. And these two qualitatively different um, response properties have been observed in so-called adapting and sensitizing cells in the retina of salamander, um, mouse, and, and primate. And so this now gives us a normative understanding as to why we might see different uh, temporal dynamics um, that signal the same underlying uh, change in, in the stimulus. And so here we would interpret this as reflecting two different objectives that these, um, that these neurons are trying to optimize. And this manifests in these qualitatively different response dynamics. Now we can go one step further and we can look at the time scale of this adaptation relative to the switching period of the stimulus. And um, as the periodicity of the stimulus increases, we see that so too does this, does this time scale of adaptation. And within our framework, this is because as the period becomes longer and longer, our ideal observer needs more and more samples to be convinced that the environment switched states. And so this leads to a longer time scale of adaptation. And this relationship between the time scale of adaptation and the periodicity of the stimulus um, has again been observed in a variety of systems from the blowfly to the mouse to the rat. Okay, so stepping back, I've told you today about a framework that we've been developing to try to understand how a resource constrained system can perform, accurately perform a task in a dynamically changing environment. And so to do this well, the system needs to balance performing the task at hand with keeping up with changes in the environment that help the system perform that task. And so this framework allows us to work out how a system should optimally balance those competing ob objectives. And we use this to identify different strategies that a system could use depending on the objective at hand, how it's, how it's balancing these different sources of error, and ultimately allowed us to read out um, dynamic trajectories uh, of, uh, of response dynamics in, in response to changing input statistics. Now, I um, illustrated much of this for you in the context of, of the scenario where the system is trying to accurately decode incoming stimuli. But this framework is much more general than the specific task that, that I've illustrated and allows us to think about um, sort of general uh, trade-offs between um, keeping up with changes in the, in the environment and, and performing uh, tasks at, at hand. So with that, I would just like to end by thanking again, um, all of this work was done jointly with Victor Monarski um, and uh, our lab has really benefited from interactions with many people, um, both within and, uh, and outside Genelia. Um, so with that, thank you all.